good afternoon everyone am i audible perfect so uh, the introduction is already done but i'll kind of reintroduce myself uh, my name is bhavesh and i work as a senior data scientist at colgate palmolive uh, i also happen to run a small youtube channel so if ever you want to learn machine learning data science concepts feel free to search for my name on youtube and you would find my channel as well uh i'll not go here in depth but i'll quickly start given that i have 20 minutes in hand so i want to cover as much as i can so that this session kind of becomes fruitful to all of you so the objective of today's talk is to introduce you to open source world in the ml space where how you can use uh, libraries that are open source from python as well as uh, there's some amazing hubs that are available so you have how many of you have heard about this amazing company called as hugging face so okay quite a lot so hugging face is basically uh, an organization that's kind of uh, the pillar for open source in natural language processing uh, all the fancy things that are coming up right now right uh, the chat gpts of the world and the long language models that are there all of them are being open sourced to some extent by hugging face which is where today what i'll talk about is tensorflow hub as well as gradio which is a open source library in python so i'll quickly start uh, so whenever you have a ml problem in hand uh, the first thing that you should do is you should search for already existing solutions rather than uh, say trying to reinvent the wheel so i'll start by the quote don't reinvent the wheel just realign it uh, this is something that's extremely important in today's day and age of ml uh, the reason is fairly simple uh, rather than having to create an end to end big machine learning or a deep learning model it's good to use something that already exist uh, try it out on a data set that you want to create a model for and then you can kind of create a web application and create an end to end system using uh, an, uh, the entire open source stack uh, one of the major challenges that i face as a data scientist slash machine learning engineer is to keep up with the pace at which things are uh, evolving in the ml ecosystem uh, how many of you know how many days did it take for 1 million users for chat gpt i know chat gpt is fairly famous so how many days did uh, chat gpt take for 1 million subscriptions 5 days right uh, so chat gpt took around 5 days whereas netflix if i am not wrong took around 11 or 15 months uh, so this is the amount of uh, say uh, usability change that has come about all because of chat gpt and the other evolving language models so one of the challenges that every data scientist faces today is uh, he has a he or she has a problem in hand uh they want to create a solution an end to end solution right uh now there are a lot of open source implementations that are available on github and other places uh but the question remains how do how does that how does that actual code that is open source how can one use it efficiently uh is it safe to use a lot of times a lot of github repositories may have the actual implementation but would not have a proper readme file as well uh is it safe to use has the model been fairly trained and is this the latest version of the model that i'm about to use right so there are different challenges that a lot of individuals face while creating end to end ml applications which is where uh, a github equivalent of machine learning comes in which is tensorflow hub uh, but before talking about tensorflow hub i want to give some idea about what tensorflow is uh, so tensorflow again is an open source library by google uh it's kind of used for creating deep learning models uh you can create deep learning models in either python so you have a python based interface for tensorflow and if you want to go really quick in terms of inferences then you have a c++ equivalent as well but majority of the tutorials that you would find online would be based on python so tensorflow is basically a free and open source software library for machine learning uh it's it can be used for variety of task okay uh you can prepare data uh so if there are if there is a batch uh, if there if there is a batch wise data that you want to input tensorflow can take care of that uh tensorflow can be used for creating ml models deep learning models uh you can deploy models which are created in tensorflow and you can implement an entire ml ops that is your devops for machine learning kind of a, a scenario as well So today's uh, main focus that I have is on TensorFlow Hub, which essentially is the GitHub for machine learning. Uh, TensorFlow Hub has various categories of uh, models. So these are open source, latest, ready-to-use models that you can kind of directly utilize from this particular website. Uh, 
uh, you have different variety of models that are available ranging from say text so uh, chat gpt is basically nothing else but behind the scene there is a text model that is understanding what you are trying to ask and is giving out an output so it's basically a generative model uh, you have image related models uh, i'm pretty sure you would have seen demos of finding uh, say a object uh, a lot of videos on say either linkedin or github would be not on github but twitter for example wherein there is good amount of object detection based tutorials that are out there uh, then you have video classification task if you want to identify if a particular user uh, if you are kind of monitoring say a cctv based system uh, and you want to monitor different people in the cctv you can train a model uh, uh, with respect to video uh, go frame by frame make a prediction and look at which person is present in that video or not and then you have audio classification as well if there are 10 15 people talking in a conversation how do you identify or how do how do you segregate different speakers is where audio classification comes in so there are multiple domains so to speak wherein ml comes in and you will have multiple such models available on tensorflow hub uh the other good part about tensorflow hub is uh you get an extended suite in terms of what all you can do with tensorflow uh so if you want to create an end to end pipeline of tensorflow uh, uh tensorflow model uh then that is where if you want to say uh, build the model get data uh say make a prediction uh, be it say an individual prediction or a batch prediction uh, monitor the predictions over a period of 3 months 4 months if there is any skew that you are seeing all of that all of that is basically po uh, possible using uh, tensorflow extended wherein you can orchestrate the entire pipeline uh, if you're not say if your model is not very resource heavy and if you feel your model can run on a web browser then tensorflow js is something that you can explore uh if you want to go the extra mile if you want to deploy your model into your cell phone be it android or ios then you can take a look at tensorflow lite and then you have coral devices how many of you know about these sample boards called as arduino raspberry pi perfect uh so if you want to deploy simple machine learning models into raspberry pi or uh, arduino boards then coral devices so you have support for them as well now how do you use it right so i've spoken at length in terms of uh, what all you can do with the models now the next question is how do you go forward and use it which is where uh, i'll quickly start with this simple example how many of you can tell me which dog breed this is someone said poodle right poodle there is one more term before poodle uh, if someone can make a guess so poodle is half correct there is some something before that as well um no <laughs> cool cool i'll quickly go forward i'll kind of let model uh, i'll let a model tell me which particular dog breed this is uh so the code is fairly simple uh, i'm assuming this is kind of visible but yeah i mean i'll kind of go through the entire code as well so i'll start by importing tensorflow as tf and tensorflow hub as hub Uh, here is where i'll supply some set of images in form of a batch every image will have three channels rgb so you'll have three corresponding matrices for them concatenated into one and if you have multiple images that you want to train then you will have one more layer to that so you'll have a four dimensional tensor which which you can directly feed into tensorflow hub now what i do is i want to directly make a classification from a pre existing model and i pass i want to pass it an image right which is where i i create a simple variable called as classify and i call the hub.keras layer uh, function i pass in the exact url of the model that i want to use once i've done that i pass in the set of images i calculate the probability scores uh, for a given row Uh, whichever probability stands out i pick out the id and i correspondingly name that this particular model is giving me a maximum probability for this image which corresponds to a corresponding id that will help me classify this particular input image okay so what i've done is i've taken an existing model i've made a simple prediction out of it right one thing that you have to keep in mind is whatever problem statement that you're trying to solve if that particular class already resides in the classes that you want to classify 
from that model then this particular approach is something that you can use directly from tensorflow hub okay uh, again let me reiterate if there is if there is a model that you want to directly use and if one of the classes say for example the dog breed that i want to classify is already part of the model that i'm using so i don't have to do anything fancy i have to download the model make a prediction and then catch hold of that prediction and use it into a web application okay is everyone awake yes, yes? perfect okay so what i do is i pass this input image and uh, correspondingly a class id comes up so the the basic uh, so this particular dog breed is toy poodle so poodle was kind of 50% right so this is how you can use tensorflow hub to make a prediction from a pretrained model for a class which already you want in your use case right but there are chances that you don't want something that uh, is already there right so say for example uh, if i want to create a new classifier that helps me classify a different set of dog breed which is something that's emerged recently right which is where how do you tackle that situation again rather than building something from scratch you will go in for something known as transfer learning everyone awake yeah. perfect so transfer learning is a technique wherein you use a pretrained model you chop off the last layers of the model retrain the entire model the only section that you want to be retrained you retrain it again and then you use a new model uh, fairly simple you don't have to worry about all the weight initializations that was taken care while retraining it uh, all you have to do is you have to pass in the new set of images that you want to add in that particular set of classes and you will have your model ready okay now i'll take a simple example Uh, i'll kind of rush through this because i have limited limited amount of time so what i'm doing here, what i'm doing here is this is my initial neural network uh, okay just to give everyone context uh, on online websites right you would see reviews you would have positive reviews and negative reviews right uh, but there are chances that you would have neutral reviews as well the product was kind of good right so it's not very positive it's neither negative right so if i have a model that kind of predicts whether a given set of review is positive or negative right so the two dots that you see at the end are my output layers this is my input neural network right so if i want to now classify a new or if i want to create a new model that helps me classify whether a given set of review is positive negative neutral or somewhat neutral you can add any uh, say random category as well then what i'll do is i'll catch hold of the initial layers of the model which is what i've done here i'll take that layer i'll add new sets of weights which would be randomly initialized i'll have four different classes as outputs i'll do the retraining uh, again and i'll have a new model from scratch wherein i have not trained the entire model i've trained only the last layers of the model so now i've taken the initial model which was classifying only two out or which was giving only two outputs uh, say positive and negative now i have converted that model i have taken the core of that model uh, retrained the final layers and i have created a new model that classifies reviews into positive negative neutral somewhat neutral you can have random categories right so this is the entire approach that i have taken for transfer learning okay and now i'll give you a small example uh, so i have a simple data set again this data set is entirely open sourced on the tensorflow website uh this contains five five classes of flowers so you have sunflower daisy dandelion tulips and uh, roses right now this is the overall distribution of the data that i have i have almost equal with maximum weightage to dandelion so i have around 900 samples for dandelion but the other classes i have around 700 to 800 samples so i have a fairly evenly distributed data, data set now in this case what i do is uh, i'll kind of go through the entire process again uh, i've imported some necessary libraries uh, i download the data file and i store it into a variable called as data underscore root i define batch size image height and image width now one of the challenges that uh, you face while creating a deep learning model is if you have say 1 lakh images uh, to train at once you cannot do that even if you have the most high end gpu all of the images at once won't fit into memory which is where you, what you have to do is you have to do a batch wise training so out of one say 1 million samples 
you would feed in 32 samples, 64 samples in one iteration. So that what happens is the model is able to learn the parameters and is not resource heavy, right? Even if you are using a high-end GPU, you can maybe push it to 1024 samples per batch. But beyond that, you cannot kind of stretch it, right? So which is where what you do is using TensorFlow again in the last in the last section of this particular code that you see here. Uh, you basically pre-processing the data wherein you are kind of splitting the data into training and validation. Uh, yeah, I mean, then you are kind of passing the image size. Uh, any reason why I've taken a uh, image size of 224 cross 224? Any fun? Input dimensions for the model. Uh, is that my lucky number why I've chosen that? S <coughs> Sorry? Perfect, perfect. So all of the information regarding that particular model in terms of what image sizes it expects is all that would be given in the TensorFlow Hub's documentation for that particular model. So the reason why I'm picking this size is because that is what the model was trained on initially, okay? What I've done is, if you remember the chopping that I've done that I don't want the last layer, I only want the actual layers. That is what I've done in the first line of code. I've created a feature extractor model. Uh, the URL would again be given to you. Uh, you add a new layer, which is your output layer. So the model that I'm using was trained to classify images into 1000 categories, right? I've chopped off the last layer. I only want five outputs now, okay? Which is where I've added a final layer. Uh, I add a sequential layer which again kind of joins five uh, neurons to the final layers that are there and I call the model.summary function uh, just to keep it very generic. I don't want to train the initial layers which is where if you look at this particular value which is trainable parameters this value is 6405 and the overall parameters are 2 lakh uh, 22 lakhs, right? Yeah, 22 lakhs, 64,000. So out of 2.2 million uh, weights in that particular network, I only want to train 5,000 values because I only want to use that entire model features, but I want to retrain it for only five classes. I go ahead with the training. I won't spend a lot of time because I have limited amount of time. But after multiple iterations or multiple epochs, my loss function, so ideally when you train a deep learning model, your loss should keep going down and your accuracy should keep increasing. So after a while, what happens is I get an overall accuracy of 87% on the limited data set that I had using a pre-trained model. Uh, this is the confusion matrix. Finally, uh, I have a model in hand. Uh, the talk title is creating web applications using machine learning. So I've told you the machine learning part. Now for people in data science and machine learning, uh, given that I have two minutes. Uh, so for people in uh, machine learning and data science, uh, people are not very good with creating front-end softwares, which is where uh, open source libraries like Gradio, uh, there's one more library called as Streamlit. I don't know if you've heard of it or not. Very popular in Python. So Streamlit and Gradio, very popular libraries which help you create UI elements uh, or web applications with very little lines of code. So I have the model ready. All I have to do is I have to create a simple uh, file uh, which will define the function in terms of how a prediction will be made from a pre-trained model. Uh, I'll have a set of inputs which will accept images. Uh, it will give out an output. So I've defined in uh, image equal to gr.inputs.image, a label equal to gr.outputs.label and I define the interface which will kind of open up an interface. You can modify the interface as well by uh, adding some markdown or CSS code. Uh, but if you want a bare bone version of a web app, uh, that is something that I'll kind of show in uh, the later slides, but can anyone guess which flower this is? Out of the five classes, I, I'll kind of come down to the total number of classes that are there. I'll again repeat the classes. So these were, the some, these were some classes, the sample classes that were there. So I hear a lot of daisy, right? So I won't give the answer. I think the model will give the answer. So this is the UI that is generated a very uh, a plain UI, so to speak. If you want to add elements, you can add CSS code and you can modify this particular implementation as well. But here it says drop, drop image here or upload here. So I'll quickly upload the image here. 
So this is an image file that I've taken, I've uploaded it here. When I press submit, it will give me the output of the machine learning model, which is that this is a rose, right? Uh, so yeah, this is all that I had given. I had to rush quickly based on the time that I had, but uh, I hope you found this informative. I wanted to share across how you can use the entire open source ecosystem in the ML domain and create some end-to-end -end machine learning applications from libraries that are again entirely open source. You can use either PyTorch or TensorFlow. Uh, you can use uh, Python-based uh, free web UI uh, applications like Gradio, Streamlit, and there are other applications as well and you can create an entire end-to-end -end solution. You can go forward, uh, so there's this uh, Streamlit share website wherein you can create a Streamlit app, deploy it on Streamlit directly. You don't have to pay any money for it as well. So yeah, this is something that I wanted to share with all of you. Uh, I hope you found this entire session informative and you would have gotten some sense in terms of how open source is making an impact in the ML world. Cool, so thank you so much.